This selective force also has a handy knack for passing on its properties to the iron objects it touches. This is a, a bar of steel. Right now it's not magnetized. To show that this is not magnetic, I'll just simply bring it down to the pile of paper clips and nothing gets picked up. All I'm going to do is touch the north pole of this magnet. Doesn't matter what pole you touch. Now, this bar of metal becomes a magnet. The first commercial magnets were made from carbon steel and later tungsten steel. These were stronger than the naturally occurring lodestone, but heat and jarring could significantly reduce their magnetism. In the 1930s, researchers created a stronger, more heat-resistant variety called Alnico, an iron-based alloy containing aluminum, nickel, and cobalt. Still widely produced today, they stored greater magnetism in a smaller package. But without an electric jolt, their magnetic potential remained dormant. You need a very large magnetic field to magnetize them adequately. So what you want to do is have an electromagnet with a large current. Magnetizing the material is a swift and simple process. Just place the wannabe magnets close to an electromagnet, then turn on the juice. The intense magnetic field realigns the alloy's atoms to make it magnetic. In 1820, Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted stumbled upon magnetism's inextricable relationship to electricity. Hans Christian Ørsted was the first to demonstrate that electric current down a wire would produce a magnetic field. He just had a compass needle near a wire. When the current went on, the compass needle turned. When the current went off, the compass needle turned back. And he thought this was very curious. This discovery tied together two separate disciplines, electricity and magnetism. Orsted discovered that they're really one and the same thing. A decade after Orsted discovered that electricity creates magnetism, English scientist Michael Faraday demonstrated the reverse, that magnetism can produce electricity. He found that moving a magnet near a magnetic field induced electric current. The oscilloscope is connected to the coil and it reads the voltage that is induced in the coil. So you can see as I move the coil through the magnet, the spot moves up and down in response. The faster you go, the greater the voltage. So if you need more electricity, you have to move it faster. Faraday's discovery was monumental. It paved the way for the invention of the electric generator, which enabled man to create electricity on a scale never before imaginable. The key to generating the power was to harness some form of mechanical energy in order to put the magnets or electric coils into motion. In a hydroelectric plant, it's water falling over the dam through the sluice way and turning the water wheel. In a coal-burning power plant, the coal makes steam and the steam turbine turns the generator. A wind power generator, the wind turns the blades of the generator. So the process is the same, mechanical energy converted to electricity. In the early 20th century, magnets were also empowering the reverse electrical motors that converted electricity to mechanical energy. The motors had eclipsed steam engines as the era's prime movers, propelling everything from trolleys to cranes to elevators. In a common electric motor, an electromagnet called the armature revolves between the north and south poles of a stationary magnet called the stator. The armature rotates until its north pole is opposite the south pole of the stator. The direction of the armature's current is then reversed by a device called a commutator, changing its north pole to a south pole. The two south poles repel each other, pushing the armature forward. 
the current reverses every half turn, keeping the armature in motion by frustrating its effort to bring north poles near south poles. Magnet-driven motors and generators accelerated the 20th century's modernization. Magnetism has been with us since the Big Bang. It's as fundamental to our world as gravity. But until the early 1800s, scientists believed magnetism was limited to magnets, like lodestone, a naturally magnetic rock. We're learning. Just ask Dr. Joshua Lederer. Today we know that the origins of all magnetism are in the atom. And it comes from the way the world works. The way the world works is the atom consists of electrical charges. They have names, the electron and the nucleus. That's essentially the two parts of the atom. And the nucleus is tiny little small thing sort of floating in the middle of a giant volume uh, in which electrons whiz around. Now, if you have an electric charge that's moving, you create a magnetic field. In some metals, like iron, clumps of atoms line up and point their poles in the same direction. We call these clumps domains. All magnets, large or small, have them. Hello and welcome, I'm Marshall Brain and today the big science question is how does electricity create a magnet? We've all seen one of these. This is a normal magnet. They come in all shapes and sizes. This is called a horseshoe magnet. If we take this horseshoe magnet and we put it near a little pile of staples, it'll pick them up. Now what if instead I take a screw like this and I hold it near this little pile of staples? What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, you're right. Nothing happens. Now let's say I take this screw and I take some normal wire and I wrap the wire around the screw. When I get done, it looks like this. It's just a normal screw wrapped in wire. If I hold that near the staples, nothing happens. Wrapping wire around a screw does not change it and turn it into a magnet. But now what if I do this? I take a normal battery and I connect it to the two ends of the wire that are wrapped around the screw. Like this. Look. A magnet. Let's watch that again in slow motion. Just by adding a little electricity, we turn this screw and wire into a magnet. Why does that happen? I mean, we have a normal screw, a normal piece of wire, we run electricity through it and suddenly it becomes a magnet. We can understand what's going on there if we look at a compass and a wire. Here we've got your basic compass with the needle pointing north and south. Now let's say we put a wire near that compass and let's say that we run some electricity through the wire like this. Watch what happens to the needle. As soon as we let electricity flow through the wire, the needle really responds to that electricity. So here's what's happening. If you take any piece of wire and you run electricity through it, the electricity will automatically create a magnetic field around that wire. It's kind of like a tube of magnetism that surrounds the wire. And that tube of magnetism actually affected our compass. We could see that that magnetism was changing the way the compass needle pointed. And that tells us that there's a magnetic field that's been created around this wire. Now let's say you take a wire and you wrap it around a screw or any other piece of metal. All those tubes of magnetism overlap and they line up along the length of the screw. That creates a very strong magnetic field right here in the center. We've created a magnet out of electricity. 
It turns out that you can do all kinds of experiments with electromagnets at home. All you need is a piece of metal like a screw and some wire. It can be thin wire like this or thicker wire with plastic insulation. It doesn't really matter. Now here's one experiment to try. Try powering your magnet with one battery. Then take two batteries and put them together and try powering it with that. Which is more powerful, one battery or two? And how much more powerful is it? Count the number of staples and record it. You'll be able to see how much stronger one or two or three batteries is. You can measure how strong your electromagnet is by counting the number of staples it picks up. The more staples, the stronger the magnet. Here's another experiment. Try wrapping 100 turns of wire around your piece of metal, then try wrapping 200 turns around it and see which of those two magnets is more powerful. You could try 300 or 400 turns as well. Or what about this? Try a screw in the center of your magnet, then try a piece of aluminum, maybe a wadded up piece of aluminum foil. Then try something that's not metal at all, maybe a piece of wood like a pencil or a piece of plastic. The point is there's all kinds of experiments and that is what science is all about. Trying experiments and learning new things. Have fun performing your own science experiments. Frogs are 90% water and water is diamagnetic. And let's imagine what happens when we bring a frog near the center of a high magnetic field region. When we do this, the diamagnetic force on the frog gets larger and larger. It may look like the frog is floating in water, but it's actually suspended in the air. The magnetic field being generated is so intense that it's canceling out the force of gravity. A magnet's power of levitation over everything from frogs to frying pans represents much more than an amusing parlor trick. It offers a world of tantalizing commercial possibilities. Say you have machinery that you want to spin very, very fast and ordinary ball bearings won't do because there's too much friction. You could levitate. They're called magnetic bearings. You can levitate the shaft and allow the shaft to rotate it in a magnetic field. A racier form of magnetic levitation is scorching its way along a 12-mile test track in Emsland, Germany. Here and in Japan, maglev engineers are developing frictionless rail systems that propel trains at speeds up to 275 miles per hour. Wondering how you levitate one of these 60-ton rail cars? The bottom section of the train wraps around a T-shaped track called the guideway. A set of electromagnets lines both sides of the train's undercarriage. An electromagnetic field generated in the guideway attracts the magnets, lifting the train less than half an inch above the track. A second set of magnets lining the train's sides exerts a lateral force, keeping the vehicle properly aligned. If you're looking for the motor that propels the maglev forward, don't bother looking anywhere on the train. It's laid out flat along the guideway. A system of magnets, like that used on Magic Mountain's Superman roller coaster. This is, for example, another application of the linear synchronous motor. If you synchronize the changing of the poles with the motion of the train, you can keep the forces going. Train engineers aren't the only ones getting a lift out of magnetic levitation. Scientists at NASA are exploring how magnets can give the spacecraft of tomorrow a boost into orbit. One of the things that we're investigating that deals with the use of uh, electromagnetic energy is a launch assist system. And this is a ground-based electromagnetic rail with levitation coils and a linear motor that provides thrust to give a launch vehicle the initial velocity from a dead stop up to 400 to 600 miles an hour. We have no contact with the ground due to the levitation. And then the linear motor provides the acceleration and the propulsion 
in the forward direction. A magnetic levitation launch system would conserve a huge amount of fuel. Fuel that would otherwise be needed to escape Earth's gravity could then be available to propel a craft deeper into space.